Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, and so what I'd like to do is just go over um, an article that was published quite a while ago, but it's sort of been a seminal article uh, on 10 myths about decision-making capacity that allow us to get to some of the nuances of uh, decision-making capacity. So the, you know, the moral foundation for why we even care about decision-making capacity, um, it's intuitive for all of us why we care, but I will give it a name and describe it. It's, for, it's our interest in respect for persons. And respect for persons is a broad uh, principle and concept that includes respecting the voluntary choices of competent adults, um, honoring uh, diversity of values, cultures, religious traditions, uh, understanding that we can ha come from a variety of different p places and um, we still would want to have our values honored in a clinical setting. But it also includes our respect for people who are vulnerable, who lack decision-making capacity or other um, capacities, and call on us to protect them. And it's precisely in the nooks and crannies between these two obligations that we often have some ethically complex cases and issues that uh, hinge on decision-making capacity. So what I'm showing you here, um, two of the really leading clinicians who write in this area, hopefully some of you are uh, familiar with them, is Applebaum and Grisso. They have published widely and often in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they are really great references and resources if you want more information and detailed information about assessing capacity. Uh, Applebaum is a psychiatrist. And so what we have here for your future reference as well are the criteria for decision-making capacity, right? What are we looking for when we're trying to figure out if our patient can make a decision? Along the left-hand side, um, first, to communicate a choice. Second, to understand the relevant information. Third, to appreciate the situation and its consequences. And fourth, to reason about treatment options. And so corollary to each of these criterion, we have basically things the patient does in order to help us figure out if that's happening as well as the physician's assessment or approach. And what you will see here, which could be very valuable to some of you, are questions that the clinician can answer to help assess these various criteria. Um, so none of this will be new to any of you. This is basic informed consent and capacity. However, um, it, this could be a, a really nice uh, resource for you. So we can move to that. So the, this 10 Myths About Decision-Making Capacity is the name of the article and the report that I'm drawing from here. It was originally a report of the National Ethics Committee of the Veterans Health Administration, and it was subsequently also published. Uh, first author is Ganzini. Um, so one myth is that decision-making capacity and competence are the same. So in my experience, we sometimes use these terms interchangeably, and often that's probably fine, right? It's probably okay. Um, there are certain circumstances, though, where you need to be aware that competency is a legal term and decision-making capacity is a clinical term. So um, basically, if someone is declared incompetent, that means that a court has ruled the patient to be unable to make valid decisions in a variety of domains that could include um, financial and other kinds of things. And, and uh, somebody has appointed a guardian to help them. Whereas decision-making capacity is assessed routinely and often in a clinical setting. And most importantly, capacity is decision-specific. So while there is not a very high bar, for example, to um, you know, figure out if somebody has capacity to, uh, let's say, make decisions about a, a simple uh, uh, test for some reason or a blood draw, uh, as, we ha as the complexity of the decision gets greater, 
so does our standards for capacity, so do our standards for capacity. So it's a graduated clinical determination. Second, lack of capacity, uh, this is a myth, lack of capacity can be presumed when patients go against medical advice. So um, if, for example, competent patients are entitled to even to make unwise choices, right, um, the implications of simply assessing capacity based on a decision that you think is not a smart one would basically lead to a plethora of ethical problems because basically the presumption there would be you aren't rational unless you agree with me, right? <laughs> and that's definitely not where we want to go. So while, of course, it, all of us have been in situations where somebody's um, uh, decision has prompted us to say, hold on just a second, that's not the reason that you're assessing capacity. It's because it's inconsistent with what the patient has been saying and what they believe and are committed to, or because um, they cannot go, th they cannot go through those criteria that we saw in terms of capacity assessment. There's some problem there. Um, so I think we'll move on. The third myth um, is that there's no need, and this is related to the other one, there's no need to assess decision-making capacity unless a patient goes against medical advice. So this is sort of the flip side. So a psychiatrist I work with closely, Mark Sullivan, who's also trained in ethics, um, he will sometimes say, you know, I'm rarely called to do a capacity assessment for someone who has agreed to the recommended intervention. But that's, that's not really right either, right? So you may have a very, very pleasant and agreeable person, and that pleasantness and agreeability may be a reflection of the fact that they lack capacity, right? And so agreeability is not equivalent to capacity. The fact that they agree with us may or may not be an authentic um, expression of their values. Assent, which is a, a sort of a, a light form of consent, meaning there are often situations where we might say, this is what I really think you ought to do. My strong recommendation is X. And what you're looking for is for the patient to say, I agree with you, doctor, or okay, I'll go along with it, or not say absolutely not, in which case you need to go into more depth. So certain decisions, uh, assent is enough. In the area we're talking about here, consent is what we're looking for, especially with um, complex decisions. So assent is also not the same thing as consent. If you really need consent, you gotta go for that. Um, and essentially the recommendation is that we assess, assess capacity in patients who are at risk for cognitive impairment. And I think the two main sources of impairment um, usually are uh, dementia and uh, um, also de delirium of some kind. So the fourth myth is that decision-making capacity is an all or nothing phenomenon. It is that, in fact, as I mentioned earlier, uh, on a sliding scale. So whereas a, pa a patient may have capacity to, to choose not to participate in rehab, for example, on a given day, or refuse other, other sorts of interventions. They may not have adequate capacity to refuse inotropes or a beta blocker or an ICD if their ejection fraction is really, really low, and they're, especially if they're on uh, maximal medical therapy. So in that circumstance, the risk of their refusal, the risk of them not understanding what we're talking about is too high for them not to get help from a surrogate. Um, uh, so patients should also participate in decision-making to the extent that they are able, and they often need help from a surrogate. So I think this is the most important thing. Almost never should a patient be entirely excluded from decisions. However we can involve them, it's our obligation to do so. But the fact, when we look back at respect for persons, that we're also looking at um, support for and protection of vulnerable people, that person may need a surrogate. Uh, the fifth myth is that cognitive impairment is the same thing as lack of decision-making capacity. So things like the min mini mental status exam or a patient's orientation is a sort of a baseline assessment of basic cognition. 
and they may have that and still not have capacity. So being sure not to confuse these two things is important. Um, the sixth myth is that a lack of capacity is a permanent condition. I think everyone here knows that it's not. Um, but we get into ethically complex situations when we're not sure if it's temporary or permanent. We simply, it's really unclear to us wh which one it is. So of course, uh, delirium or acute psychosis would be temporary, and something like advanced dementia is permanent. You need a permanent and long-term surrogate in the latter case. The seventh myth is that uh, a lack of relevant information is the same thing as a lack of capacity. I think we all agree that it's the physicians, the clinicians responsibility to ensure um, that we are providing information repeatedly. Um, we are looking for areas of misunderstanding or, or lack of understanding from our patients and we're doing our best to fill those in and to give them the information delivered in the way they can best understand it. And since, since misunderstandings are common even among all of us day in and day out who have full capacity, right? Um, we might ne need to take extra care with some of these patients. Um, the other thing my colleague Dr. Sullivan and others have pointed out is the actual assessment of capacity, the care and time dedicated to trying to make sure your patient understands and understanding what they're thinking can actually lead to an improvement of capacity for certain decisions. Um, and so there's a multiple benefits from sort of devoting some time there. Um, the eighth myth is that some psychiatric disorders basically determine that the patient lacks capacity. Um, and this is not the case, and I think even when you, um, when there have been some uh, surveys, people still, even physicians, will still misunderstand this and think that if a patient has Alzheimer's disease or schizophrenia, they, they, they lack capacity. That is absolutely not the case people need to have, it's acute psychosis or something for them to lack capacity. And of course, we go back to it depends on the decision that needs to be made. Um, ninth, involuntary patients lack capacity. No. Um, and this is trickier. I won't pretend to be an expert here. But um, patients who are involuntarily committed for some reason, they're committed for a danger to themselves or others, so the, the rationale for that is based on the safe, their safety, right, or the safety of others. It's not really to deny them um, the expression of their, their choices. So they basically should be able to make all healthcare decisions except those for which they lack specific capacity. Um, and that includes in, in many circumstances that the very reason that we're admitting them in order to help treat the underlying disease that's compromising their capacity, the patient may still have the right to refuse that treatment, which is tricky. Um, and there are, because they're particularly vulnerable, and state by state there are different due processes and uh, uh, special protections for them. And finally, uh, the, the myth that only mental health experts can assess capacity, clearly that's not the case. Um, this is a routine part of clinical care, and um, even though, of course, in acute situations we do need to have to assess under those circumstances, it's often best done by people with a longitudinal relationship with the patient because they can, they're able to see the storyline of the patient's belief system um, and their values playing over time. But certainly, we need help under certain circumstances, um, and we're, we should get it. Um, and certainly in particularly complex situations where somebody is going to, or we're, think, we're trying to figure out if they have the capacity to, let's say, to refuse a life-sustaining treatment, even though we might have a sense of capacity, we might want to get more people involved um, in that situation. Uh, and then in general, as we lead into our case, in my experience, ethical conflicts arise when, first, there are differences of opinion about whether a patient has capacity for the decision at hand, and usually there's actually good reason for these differences of opinion because things end up being pretty um, ambiguous. The other time it comes up is when providers, so sometimes when we're, when we're not sure exactly what's happening with the patient, right, we're not entirely sure if they have full capacity for what we're asking for or not. Some of the providers will treat the patient as if they have capacity, and others will treat the patient as if he or she does not. And 
this is often not stated as an explicit issue, and when you state it as an explicit, explicit issue, it actually helps to solve the ethical problems, because now you can have a conversation. Wait, on what basis do I believe, am I treating the patient in one way or the other? And then you can compare the kinds of decisions in which um, those things are happening. The other thing I just want to point out is we never want to confuse a patient's preference from his or her choice or decision. So there have been cases, for, so example, somebody who completely lacks capacity may have lots of preferences, including things none of us would want, like, I really don't want that feeding tube, right? I really don't want it, right? That's a preference, but if the patient lacks capacity, if you treat the preference as if it's a choice, in other words, let's say that that patient really can't make this kind of decision, it's too high stakes. Um, and we're waiting, we don't want to intubate the patient even though they're cachexic and we need to get to some, and we aren't sure what the underlying medical conditions, whether they're reversible or not. Um, if we wait too long because we don't want to um, hurt the patient by doing something that he doesn't want to have us do, we're actually undermining the situation, right? If we need to get, we should probably act, if he lacks capacity, his preference is that we don't put a, a, a tube in, but we need to put that tube in for his well-being in order to get to, for him to improve and maybe reverse his decision-making capacity, then we should do it rather than kind of getting tripped up in is this preference actually a choice, if that makes sense. So now I can open it up to questions. If anyone has any questions, thanks for your time. <laughs>